Hi there. Have you ever wondered if there is more to Christianity than what is popular? Are you dissatisfied in any way with your present spiritual state and your yearning for more of God? Do you desire a company of people who are on a journey of maturity toward Christ-likeness? Do you want your Christianity to make a positive impact on society? If you answer yes to any of these questions, then I would like to invite you to the Finishing Church here in Abuja. We are a borderless kingdom community of people who are being trained and equipped to become like Christ in order to impart our society positively. We are also being prepared for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We are the new breed that is committed to bringing all of God's purposes to completion here on earth and we look forward to welcoming you home. God bless you. Seated, hallelujah. I mean, what a session already! What a session! And we just bless God for our ministers in the house. We bless God. I bless God and I celebrate every one of you. Celebrate you, Emmanuel. I celebrate you, Lady Faith. I celebrate you for connecting with the heart of the Father and bringing the heart of the Father to us. You see, when people stand accurately in the Spirit, you know. You, you, you know when people stand accurately in the Spirit, when people are, are picking signals and frequencies from, from the heart of the Father, you just know. You just know. You see, in the realm of the Spirit, there's no confusion. There's no confusion. And I've always said this, if we all stand accurately in the realm of the Spirit, we will hear the same thing. You will know. You will know where that frequency is coming from. You know it's not coming from a 30-fold dimension of operations in the Spirit. Because there is a 30-fold dimension of operations in the Spirit. That is the level of bread. That is the level of bread. And there's also the 64 dimension of operations in the spirit. That is the level of power and anointing, manifestation of power. But there is a hundredfold dimension of operation of the spirit. That is the level of the fullness of Christ. The divine nature. Divinity. Divinity. You know, and this level, the devil can't operate. The devil can give you bread. The devil can manifest power. But the devil can never manifest the nature and the character of God. He can only pretend. He can't come into the divine. You know, and this is where God has brought us to in this season. We are indeed the most privileged generation. That's why in Hebrews 11 and 12, reading out the exploits of the men and women of faith, and he said, all of these died without receiving the promise. Because God had better things in store for us. So that apart from us, they will not be made perfect. So we are the one to touch perfection on their behalf. Hallelujah. So as we come into perfection, they will then be made perfect. What a privilege. And that is why we can't settle for bread. 30 fold. That is why we can't settle for 60 fold. Just power, 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 power. Are we going to be blessed? Are we being blessed? Yes! Yes! We are not discontinuing that dimension. We are being blessed. We are being promoted. Businesses are expanding. People are coming into new levels of wealth. They had never come into before. Yes! We are not denying that. They risk their bread there. Yes! We are a blessed people, right? Yes. Even in the midst of the economic crunch in Nigeria, we are still being blessed. Because we are not only being blessed, we are also being blessed to be a blessing to other people. When the world is responding to the economic hardship by being tight-fisted, God is telling us this is the time to be generous. Give. Be mindful of those who don't have. 
Be mindful of those who don't have. So we have been blessed. Do we operate in power? Yes. We place our hands on the sick and they recover. We operate in the power of God, in the anointing of God. That is the 60 fold, but that is not the end. Now we are coming into the fullness of Christ, the divine nature. That is the hundredfold. Hallelujah. That is the hundredfold. And that is what is going to bring this project, humanity at this phase, to an end. And the devil doesn't want that. Hallelujah. He doesn't want us to come into the fullness of Christ. But this is the process. We have to die. We have to die. You can't keep this nature and come into the fullness of Christ. The two. That's why you will see that seed that you are planting. By the time you go back, you don't see it again. You will not see the old seed and see the new by the side. No. One has to die for the new to emerge. And you see that as the old seed is decaying in the soil, after a while, the new life form will begin to emerge. All right? And so the more of the new life form you get, the less of the old you get. And so by the time it fully germinates, the old is completely gone. And by the time it germinates and it grows, it begins to do what? Bear fruit after its kind. That is the process that we're going through. So in case if where you are now, you're yet to start sprouting. Because some of us, you're starting sprouting, right? As a matter of fact, some of us, we have gained roots already. We are established. That is why you will tell yourself, oh, this journey, nothing can take me off this path of Christ likeness. It doesn't matter. There's no amount of money, fame, or popularity that will seduce me off this path. Those of you who have come to that level means that you have gained root into the ground. Nothing. Put a gun to my head. Nah, this message won't change. Offer me, it don't change. It's Christ. There's nothing you can offer me. It's Christ. Until I fully become like Christ. I'm not backing down. So for those of you who have come there, you've gained roots. For some of us, we are still sprouting. We are still sprouting, still sprouting, still sprouting. So there is the, the old nature is still struggling, but it's, it's dying. But for some, you've just been planted. You have just been planted into your process. And you can't see anything, it looks dark. It looks dark. It looks like, is this, is this what it is? Is, is, this, is this the reformation? Is it what it should be? You know, I, I, I can't see. I can't see. I can't see here. Stay there. Stay there. You see, because the voice of the enemy is louder at that stage. Yes. The voice of the enemy is louder at that stage. He will come and he will come and be saying different things to you. But stay there. Go through the process. Go through the process. Hallelujah. We are the manifestation, the fullness of that seed. And I'm reminded, just want to recall to us one of our anchor scriptures in TF Church behind our mandate. What God is building in this house. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That's what we're coming to. We're coming to a perfect man. We're coming to perfection. We're coming to perfection, to a perfect man. And then to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is it. This is what we're coming to. This is what scares the enemy. This scares the devil. Operating at the level of bread, no biggie. Operating at the level of power, no big deal. But operating at the level of the fullness of Christ... That is a big deal to the enemy. Because this 
is what will shut down time. And that's why if you move to chapter 5 of Ephesians, of Ephesians, you would say, he says it's coming for a church without spot, a church without wrinkle, a blameless church without blemish. You see that in Ephesians 5. That is a church that he is coming for. Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself to her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. Glorious church. This is the church that Christ is coming for. This is the church that will shut down time. And this is the church that is a threat to the enemy. This is the church that is a threat to the enemy. And so when the enemy comes, you're on this path, his target is not just your well-being. His target is not just your sustenance. His target is this, right here. Right here. That's why, like I said earlier on, if the devil cannot stop you from giving your life to Christ, he will do everything possible to stop you from coming here. From coming to the fullness of Christ. Including sending religious spirits to the church. And then you are just at the level of 30-fold bread. You know, so if everything as a believer that you are interacting with in God is give me, give me, give me my breakthrough, my new job, my visa, my this, my appointment, give me, give me, give me. You are still operating at the level of bread. You are not a threat to the enemy. And now we have a church that is growing in power, doing great anointing and great work and all of that. The devil can also display power. As a matter of fact, a significant portion of the power we see display in so-called church is actually the enemy. It's actually the enemy, deception. But you see this Christ-likeness? No, the devil can't fake this. See that you are like God or you are not. So that you are like Christ or you are not. He can't duplicate this in its true essence. He can only show you a form of it. But he can't duplicate this. But when you check the true essence, you will see, no, that is deception. And so this is where we are coming to. This is what the enemy doesn't want you to touch. Perfection in God. Christ-likeness. Christ likeness. So anytime you the Holy Spirit had light some struggles to you, fight them to a standstill. Don't settle. That's why we say if you see anything in your life that is not part of the nature and the design of God, don't settle. Don't say this is who I am. It's not who you are. It is not. Hallelujah. So last week we started going back again to the series, Living from Eternity. And we were able to establish two important things. Our, our original identity in God and our purpose in God. And we said that um, we predict time. When he said in Jeremiah, before I formed you in your, in your, in your mother's womb, I knew you. You existed somewhere. In him. And on Wednesday we were here. And one of our brothers asked a question that got us really into going deep. The question just set us into the heart of the father. Say, where were we? In what form were we? In what form did we exist? In that state. Before we were conceived. And before we came into time. And then scriptures started flying. People were responding. It was such an awesome time here. That's why I always encourage our folks, please, join. Don't just come. Don't be a Sunday, Sunday person. You see, Sunday is maybe 
of understanding is what you're going to gain today. When you come on Wednesday when everybody is sharing, you gain another 40%. If you have the time to listen to the message once or twice, you gain the other, maybe another 10%. And then when you start working out what you have heard, 20%, 100-fold. Hallelujah. That is it. That's why the Bible says faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word. It was such a wonderful time on Wednesday. And in Ephesians 1, from verse 3, you guys have my slide, by the way. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Can you see that? Before the foundation of the world was laid, he chose us. And then we looked at Kronos, which refers to time, and we looked at eternity, Oranos in Greek, which means heaven, the abode of God. In Hebrew, Olam means forever. The abode of God, that is forever. That is eternity. And we also said that our purpose predates time. And we saw that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Where the Bible says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should work in them beforehand, meaning before time. Second Timothy chapter 1 from verse 8. The Bible says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in his sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Your purpose was designed before time began. Your identity was designed before time began. It is the fall and time that has made a mess of us. And we need to reclaim our original identity before time began. Even though we will continue to live less than who we were designed to be originally. Hallelujah. Amen. Tell your neighbor, don't sleep. And we say that our reality is in Christ. And in Christ, we are no longer slaves to time. In Christ, we are no longer slaves to time. And when you have eternity as your reference point, you become immune to the to earthly value system. And this means we live inside time, but we work in purposes that flow to us from eternity and then from us out to eternity. So we are living from eternity for eternity. Hallelujah. That's what it means. We are living from eternity for eternity. And so let's move very quickly to the part two. Just move couple of slides down. And then let's look at the image again. Next slide. So this is the image that we looked at. So I just made minor adjustments to what we saw last week. So the vastness out there is eternity, right? The box is time. The box is time. Time is limiting. That's why man will leave X, Y, Z number of years. You're gone. All right, but your soul lives forever. Your soul goes into eternity where it gets to live forever. So, but this time, either it lives forever with God or lives forever in damnation. And what you do in time is what the time is where your soul is going to live forever. All right, so out there, everything you see there is time, is eternity rather. And then the box represents time, and that is you in time. And if you look at the arrow coming from this other side, it says, says impute, right? And so you live by what comes from eternity. So your identity is from eternity. Your purpose is from eternity. Your value system is from eternity. Instructions, daily instructions from eternity. Character formation from eternity. Your principles that you live by to raise your children to do your business, to conduct your affairs in time from eternity. The blueprint of your life and of your business and of your marriage from where? From eternity. That's why we tell couples, your marriage has a purpose. 
Your marriage has a blueprint. You need to discover the blueprint of your marriage. Your entire life has a blueprint. And that blueprint was designed in the heart of the Father before time began. From eternity. Ideas with which you do your business. Innovation, all of that. Solutions from eternity. Wisdom from eternity. Because there's also the wisdom of this world, right? Uh huh. There's a wisdom of this world. Then there's a wisdom of God. You get your wisdom from eternity, not the wisdom of this world. You don't do your business with the wisdom of this world. You don't say, if you can't beat them, you join them. No. If you can't beat them, you stand out. You stand out, and when you stand out, you beat them. You don't join them. Oh, it's wisdom. It's wisdom. Wisdom to shift your values. It's not wisdom. It's the wisdom of this world. You see, any wisdom that will demand that you shift your values, that you compromise your values, is the wisdom of this world. It's not from eternity. The wisdom from eternity will tell you that there is nothing in time that is worth you shifting your values for. The wisdom of God will tell you, stand on the principles of God. Stand on the values of the kingdom. That is the wisdom of God. Because that is where life is. And so you live by the identity, purpose, instructions, commands, ideas, principles flowing to you from eternity. And then you engage and you occupy on earth. Hallelujah. So you use all of those things to determine your lifestyle, your assignment, your engagement, your business, everything you do here in time. And we also said that time has its own principles and values. It has its own wisdom. But you're not supposed to live by the principles and values of time. So, but we engage in time with what is flowing to us from eternity. And when you engage in time with what is flowing to you from eternity, the output will then flow back into where? Into eternity. And then that is when what then goes as deeds. In Revelation, I record last week that there are books, right? The Bible says there are books in Revelation. There's a book of life and then there are books. So those books, the book of life contains the names of those that will make it, right? The other books, I call them the books of deeds. That's where the record of your life is being written. Everything you're doing. And so your deeds are there in eternity. That is where your treasures are. That's why the Bible says that where a man's treasure is, that's where his heart will also be also, right? That's it. Your treasures are there. You are laying up and storing up treasure in eternity. Your maturity is going there. It's been recorded there. The souls that you are winning. There's a record of the souls you are winning. There's a record of the souls you are winning. That's what the Bible says. He who wins souls is what? Is wise. Who is coming into the kingdom on your account? Who is coming into maturity on your account? Who is in the kingdom because you stood, because you spoke, because you invited, because you engaged, because you lived the life? There's a record in heaven. And you can't afford to be bankrupt. When the books are opened, you can't afford to be bankrupt. You must be able to stand and present everything before the Father. You can't be bankrupt. Because it's going to come. It's going to take stock. You live for 30 years, 50 years, 60 years, 80 years. God has expectations. Within this time frame, Stephen ought to have saved 50 souls. And the 50 souls ought to have affected 500 people. The 500 people down the line ought to have saved the whole nation. And so if all my brother Stephen used his time to do here just to get busy and for sustenance and just to get by, he will be bankrupt in that area. Because we said this on Sunday that we will not only be judged by the things, by our deeds, we will also be judged by the things we are meant to do on the day of final judgment. You will be judged by the things you were meant to do. So souls you have won, impact you have made in society, 
What difference are you making in society? What impact are you making in society? How are you giving back? How are you making the world a better place? How are you being a part of the solution and not a part of the problem to be solved? Or are you being a part of the problem of Nigeria? There's record in heaven. If you've also been a part of solving the problem of Nigeria, there's record in heaven. The things we take for granted, God does not take for granted. He's an astute businessman. When he came back, he expected the one that he gave one talent to produce two. The one he gave two, he expected four. The one he gave five, he expected ten. You can't, we can't be careless the way we live. So we must watch out for the input. What is the input into your life? And what is going out of your life and flowing back into eternity? You must watch out. You must be very deliberate. You see, if this input are not flowing into your life from eternity, it means everything that you are living is time-based. And anything that is time-based does not have eternal value. It means that you are living for time. That's why the Bible says that if this is the only place where you have hope, you are of all men, what? Most miserable. In other words, if you don't have eternal hope, if there's nothing else you are yearning for, if there's nothing else you are living for that is beyond time, you are of all men, what? Most miserable. If time defines your life, time defines your existence, time defines everything that you are doing, you are of all men most miserable. That's what the Bible says. If this is the only place you have hope, what does it mean to have hope here? It means that you are doing everything to gain advantage here. Everything you are doing is, how will it profit me here? And you are mixing everything. How will it, if I greet you, will you greet me back? If, if I give you, will you give me back? You know, that's the principle of the world. And if all of that is what defines your hope, you can't see that love someone who, the Bible says love someone who, who hates you. That's why the Bible says that if you love only those who love you, you are not doing anything special, time-based. If you truly really want to know that you are living in love, love someone who naturally is not deserving of it. Now, eternity. When you do that, that flows into eternity. When you only love someone who loves you, time-based, nothing special. Even unbelievers do that. That's what the Bible says. So we need to understand the construct of life in eternity. So that we can bring it and superimpose it here on time. That's what it means to be a believer. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. Jesus Christ was a disruptor. He didn't come here he did, and then blend in. He didn't blend into the political structure of his day. He didn't blend into the religious structures of his day. He came to disrupt. You see, Christ-like people are disruptors. You cannot be a Christ-like and be a conformist in that sense. You can't be Christ-like and you want people to like you. Sorry, those two, they don't mix. People will not like you. And you must be comfortable with that. Because Christ was a disruptor. He didn't blend in. He didn't. He stood out. And his life is a pattern for us. He came to show us how to be. And the Bible said that he was tempted, but he did not what? He did not sin. So you think you have an excuse to sin when you are tempted? You don't. Because Jesus already set the, pres- the precedent for us. He said, this is how to live. You will be tempted, but don't sin. No excuse. That's why I said, don't let someone else's misbehavior make you misbehave. No. Don't let someone, don't let anybody pressure you to, to, to offending God. There's no justification for it. So this is how we are supposed to live. Hallelujah. So I'm going to be very fast just reading some scriptures. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Hallelujah. I know some of you are expecting this scripture, right? Romans 12, 2. Ah, okay. That's quite what we can manage. He says here, don't become so well adjusted to your culture, the culture of time. You see, any time the Bible says your, it means time. Not his. Anytime it says his, it means eternity. Hallelujah. So don't become so well adjusted to your culture, 
time-based culture. That you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, eternity. And it says, you will be changed from the inside out. So as you fix your gaze on God, you will be changed from inside out. You see, it's somewhere on the slide. As you interact with the identity that is coming from eternity, interact with the purposes coming from eternity, interact with instructions coming from eternity, interact with value systems coming from eternity, as you interact with them here, what is happening to you? You are not only producing, you are also being transformed. Yes, you have been transformed. And that is what's actually responsible for our consistent transformation here. Because we keep interacting with what's flowing to us from eternity. Hallelujah. He said, you will be changed from the inside out. And he went on to say, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. All like the culture around you, time, again, and he says you, it means time. Culture around you, time. That's what it means. Always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. So in other words, eternity, maturity. Time, immaturity. Eternity, up, upper. Time, lower. That's why we call it upper rim. Upper rim does not mean vertical. No, it's just a dimension. So we do this to help us understand. Heaven is not up there. If you fly in space. But we use that to help us understand that it is superior life. This is an inferior life. You see, time-based principles, time-based conditionalities, time-based everything is inferior to eternity. Hallelujah. It's inferior. So that's why I say when you live in sin, when you lie, you cheat, you are living that inferior life. You are living less than who God designed you to be. Hallelujah. See, all like the culture around you, time, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. Develops well-formed maturity in you. That's what happens. And so time seeks to drag us down to its level. Its level, its lowliness, its limitations, its corruption. That's what time seeks to do. To pull you down to its level, lowly state, inferior state, corrupted state, limitations, constraints. That is what time seeks to do. When we live from eternity, we break free from the gravitational pull of time or mortality. You see, when you live from there, you break free from the limitations here. Hallelujah. Here it says, if you do me, I do you. But there it says, turn the other cheek. Here it says, if you love me, I love you. There it says, love those who hate you. Here it would say, I will look out for the good of those who look out for my good. There it says, pray for those who use you, who persecute you. So when believers are gathering and pray for the death of their president, I don't understand. That's time-based. When believers are gathering and they are praying that their president will catch COVID, I don't understand where that is coming from. That's not what eternity says. Eternity says, pray for those who despisefully use you. That is eternity. Where are you living from? You see, it's time based. It's time that we whip up this sentiment and emotions, 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 emotionalism. It's time. You see, when you live from that place, you are, you, you are not normal. You can't be normal. That's why I said Jesus was a disruptor. You were designed to be a disruptor. Yes, you were designed to be a disruptor. We are not normal. We're not supposed to be normal in time. Hallelujah. You're not supposed to be normal. That's why when the others are doing business a certain way, and you come and say, no, sorry, I don't do business like that. But they say, that's how we do it. That's how we say, no, sorry. I say, you will lose it. Oh, yes, I lose. But when I lose, I actually gain. I gain a strike. 
that I will go and show him when I see him. So it was a privilege to suffer for your sake. What a privilege. Because I tell people, see, what mark, what cut are you going to show him when you see him as his disciple? If everything you are doing here is just dodgy persecution, dodgy hardship, negotiating your values, just because you want to, because they have promised you Christianity without suffering. Sorry, it doesn't exist. Christianity without challenges, it doesn't exist. Except you are just dodging, dodging, compromising your values just to get by. And that is why people will go and do all manner of crazy stuff in, in the business world. And they will come and say, praise the Lord and shout hallelujah and share testimony. But the principles with which they came about that testimony was time-based. Time-based principles. You can steal money, public funds, and then you come and share testimonies. No. For us, we don't lose, we win. You see, even when they deny you opportunities because you are insisting on kingdom values and principles, you have not lost, you have won. You see, the world will tell you you have lost, but heaven tells you you have gained. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have gained. That's why I say if your hope is here, is, that's a miserable life. You see, what the world thinks, what you have lost here, you have gained there. But because your, because your heart is there, you will not see it as loss. Because there's a gain. There's profit there, even though you have lost here. That's how we're meant to live. And so as we engage with everything that flows to us from eternity, in time we are transformed into our original identity and form. The you that God knew before the foundation of the world is what you are transformed into. Every time you engage with what flows to you from eternity, you begin to realize, ah, ah, so this, this is my authentic self. I'm supposed to love, even though you are hating me, I'm supposed to love you. And as you are doing that, you are being transformed. Can you, have you noticed that the first time you do it is hard? Then after that first time, it becomes easy. Uh -huh. It's because that first time, you are still trying to master your original design. After doing it, you then master it. It then becomes easy to forgive. Mm -hmm. It's because you have now become. You have, you have been transformed. But the first time will be tough. The first time you're cheated and God says, look away, it's hard. But the next time you're cheated, you say, no, it's okay, take it, go. It's, it's not business, it's not just money. I forfeit my shares. Bye-bye. But the first time will be hard. But the second time, it has become your nature. Hallelujah. That's how we are transformed as we live by the principles flowing to us from our original home. You gain the version of you that existed in the heart of God before time began. As you interact with principles, values, instructions flowing from eternity. That's how we are transformed, guys. So yes, I acknowledge the first time it will be tough. When you lose that business, the first time, trust me, it will be tough. But you see, subsequently, it will not be tough. You will let it go. You will let it go. Or something happens and your natural inclination is do the person back. Clap back. I have an opportunity and let me hit her back. And then the Holy Spirit flows. That's not you. How you respond. And then the moment you align with what the Holy Spirit is saying, you are denatured. Yes. You are denatured. That's why I always say this. The reason you are still here, one of the reasons you are here after giving your life to Christ is because of this process. Because when man fell, man fell big time. So there's a need for a process in time that will re-engineer re us into our original design. And this is where we become like Christ. Hallelujah. This is where we become like Christ. Because the level of maturity you attain in time is what you will take to eternity. It's what you take to eternity. If you're a baby here, you'll be a baby there. You can be 100 years old here. But if you're a baby spiritually, you'll be a baby there. And so that is how we are transformed. Hallelujah. So let's look at patterns in Christ. Patterns in Christ. Just reading some scriptures. <coughs> John 
John chapter 5, verse 19. Let's look at patterns in Christ. You know, Christ is in the center of our lives, right? It's everything. It's who, it's who we are becoming. You want to know who you are, look at the life of Christ. You want to know who you are, you want to know yourself, look at Christ. He's the firstborn among many brethren. He's our older brother. We carry the same spiritual DNA. That's why I say if you pick up some things from your parents that are not in alignment with Christ, what do you do? You denounce them and reject them. Hallelujah. The things we pick from our parents, they are only as valid as they are in Christ. If they are not in Christ, they are not valid. Hallelujah. And you can stand and say, no, I am of the order of Christ. Not the order of the Adetibas. And so anything that is not found in Christ is not authorized to be in my life. I denounce and I reject every time-based imposition over my life. In the name of Jesus, you stand. You stand. John chapter 5 verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, this was when they were really, you know, the religious people were really mad that Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Like I said, he was a disruptor. He didn't fit into the religious order of his day. He didn't want to be liked by them. He came with the truth. And he spoke that truth. So they were mad that he healed on the Sabbath day. So that's the background to this. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. But what he does, he does what, what he sees his father do. For whatever he does, that's what, for whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. Hallelujah. So Jesus lived from where? From eternity. He lived from eternity. Verse 30 says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. Hallelujah. He lived from eternity. John 17, from verse 14. This was when Jesus was departing. He was praying for them. And he was telling the Father, I have given to them your word, the message you gave me. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. You remember earlier on, I, say, I said, if you want the world to like you, I don't know the other, I don't know. I said, the world hated them. So you can't be someone who is, can't be a people pleaser. You can't be someone who, you are not ice cream. You want everybody to like you. No, no, no. No, the world won't like you. You see, the people that are meant to like you are your siblings here. Because they are the ones that really understand you. They understand, they know where you are coming from. They share the same spiritual DNA as you. They are the ones that will like you. But you see the world, the world won't like you. That's why I say truth is a new hate speech. When you speak the truth today, people will dislike you for it. Including religious systems. They will dislike you for it. So you can't live your life because you want to be liked by the world. Because he said, the world has hated them because they are not of the world. And because they do not belong to the world. Just as I am not of the world. And do not belong to it. So you don't belong to time. Just as Christ did not belong to time. And he said, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them and protect them from the evil one. And he went on to say, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Just to emphasize that again. You are not of the world. Just as Christ, when he was here, he was not of the world. So living from eternity and for eternity is an adventure of faith. Hallelujah. Now, I won't go very deeply into this. We're just going to go, the next phase, we'll be looking at how. How do we live? from eternity, for eternity. But one thing I want you to know that is that it's an adventure of faith. You must be willing to abandon your own will in order to be able to access and obey the will of the Father. 
That's why the transaction this morning during the worship was so apt. I am a sacrifice. I pour myself on the altar. I die to my preferences, my will, my desires, my emotions that are not in alignment with your will. That's what, it, that's what it takes to be able to live from eternity. You have to die to your own will. This faith adventure requires trust, patience, and obedience. John chapter 6 verse 38 says, For I have come down from heaven. Heaven is where? Eternity. You remember what we said about eternity? Orenius. It means the abode of God, right? Yes, it means the abode of God. Jesus said, for I have come down from heaven, I have come down from eternity. Not to do my will. My will is time-based desires. But to do the will of him who sent me. So do you want to live from eternity? You must abandon your will. If you don't abandon your will and your preferences, you cannot live from eternity. You can't. You must be ready to abandon your will. You must be ready to abandon your preferences for you to be able to live from eternity. Hallelujah. And just to remind us again about the finishing church. You're wondering, why are we so on this path? Because it is who we are. We can't move from here. We can't. We can't shift from here. If you look at our name, the finishing church, John chapter 4, verse 34, that is the anchor scripture for the name, the finishing church. Ephesians 4, that's our identity. Ephesians 4, from verse 11, that is our purpose, defines our purpose, who we are becoming. But here defines our identity. The finishing church. John 4, 34, from Amplified Classic. It says, Jesus said to them, my food, which is my nourishment, is to do the will, the pleasure of him who sent me and to accomplish and completely finish his work. It's to do the will of the Father and to finish his work. So that which gives us life, that which gives us enjoyment. That is why Lady Kems was doing her fierce um, woman session yesterday. Fierce wise, right? Yeah, I was in the living room, I was eavesdropping. And one of the things she said, she said to the women, she was talking to them about intimacy, different kinds of intimacy, right? You know, we have spiritual intimacy, we have huh? physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, and she said the biggest and the most important of all is what? The spiritual intimacy. She asked the question, I think it was Esther that answered. Don't worry, I was doing my work. I, trust me, I, I was doing my work. I, I was doing my own work. The truth is this. You can't be living with Lady Kems and not want to sit under her teaching, even if it does not concern you directly. I was doing my work in the living room. And it was great. And she asked the question, and it was Esther that responded. As a matter of fact, when she asked the question, I was like, who's going to get it? I was like, the person that has to get it has to be a member of the, of, the, of, of the finishing church, has to be a finisher. And it was Esther that got the answer. My wife didn't know these things. I was just quietly sitting down by the side. So the, the, the biggest and the most profound intimacy between husband and wife is spiritual intimacy. It's spiritual intimacy. You know, that, because that's where you must connect deeply. That's where you must connect deeply. So when you want to talk about satisfaction, satisfaction, it starts to be spiritual satisfaction. At this point, he was already hungry. He was tired in the flesh. He was hungry. He was famished. His disciples knew he had not eaten for a while. They had gone to look for food for him. And when they came, they were concerned about the fact that he had not eaten. And they were like, ah, master, you should eat and all of that. Why? He said, no. He said, this is my food. It is my food. It's doing the will of my father. Oh, guys, sometimes eh, I may be tired, oh, tired, tired. But you see, anytime I have an opportunity, you, some of you, you would have experienced this. You have an opportunity to pour and to help people and to talk to people. You know, you feel alive. 
Uh -huh. That was what Jesus was feeling here. Our greatest intimacy with my wife. Oh, God. It's spiritual intimacy. He's number one. He's number one. By the time we live here now, and we got to get to the car, they knew. All the aunties. She's there. Auntie Joy. Auntie Touch. They will, will walk. Our feedback will start from the car. Because one thing I've realized that some husband and wife, the only bond when they have a common enemy, enemy to fight. They bond around common enemy. The moment there is no, no, there's nobody inside that they are fighting, they are fighting each other. The only time that they bond is when there's someone they are gossiping about. That's when they bond. Every other time, this one is knows here, this one is knows here. But no, it shouldn't be so among you. You see, your spiritual intimacy should be top-notch. Whereby you, you delight in, 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 in unpacking the word. In, uh, you see, if you see the way we do feedback, you will never believe that it's a message that either of us thought. I'm serious. You will never believe. And then I will still go and listen to the message myself. Because I don't want to, after being a blessing to you, then me, myself, I will become a castaway. No. Because it's possible for your gift to bless people and not transform you. It's possible. It's possible. What God has put for you for people can bless people, transform their lives, and you, you are untouched. It's possible. And I don't want that. That's why in Congress, we always say this, we lead from the front. Yes, in Congress, as a leader, you lead from the front. Whatever it is, whatever demand God is placing on people, you have to do twice as much as a leader. And so, this, Jesus Christ, his satisfaction was anytime he's communing, anytime he's doing the will of the Father. And so, that must be you as well. That must be you. You know, it was this morning I was just reflecting on the intimacy between husband and wife. I was like, my goodness. Because I know how I feel anytime I'm with my, I'm with my wife and we're chilling and we're talking and we're, you know, and all of that. So I was like, oh God, so this is how it is anytime I spend time with you. Wow. I will spend more time with you. Hallelujah. I'm like, ah, so this is how it is anytime I spend time with God. It's the way it is anytime I spend time with my wife. I'm like, ah, no, I will spend time with you, God. I won't let you be jealous again over me. I will spend time, I will, I will make time for you, my father. I, I will make sure I'm intimate with you all the time. I will enjoy that. As you are here, you should be enjoying this. You should not be thinking about Sunday rise. You should not be thinking about that show you want to go and watch after here. You should be enjoying this. Intimacy with God. Husband and wife, brothers, as you live here, let the intimacy continue. Unpack this before Wednesday. Be sharing what stood out to you. Don't go and be commenting on what the person said that didn't, that didn't come out right. And how what the person said is offending you. You know, it's so sad sometimes when people leave here, instead of them to unpack the word, they are using it to gossip about their leaders. No. No. Or gossip about their brothers or their siblings. No, come on. Come on. Come on. Spend time with God. Unpack the word. That's Christ there. That this is what gives me satisfaction. This is where I'm alive. I know now for some of you, you know anytime some of you, and I know this has already happened to some of us, that anytime you're talking about something, something real and all of that, but by the time it's becoming gossip, you get cautioned, right? Yes. Because you have descended into the flesh. Now you're no longer discussing. You're not gossiping. It's now becoming destructive. Your heart is becoming corrupted. Yes. To corrupt your heart. Because that's why the Bible says, Jesus Christ said, it's not what comes in. It's not what the person has done. It's what comes out. How are you responding to it that corrupts the heart? Hallelujah. And so you must. You ask yourself, this conversation, is it defining me? Is it building the next person? Are we learning from this? Even when something has happened, are you learning from it? Are you ensuring that you don't find yourself in that kind of situation? That is when it is constructive. Not just damaging to the, to the next person. 
And so the Living Bible says, Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God. Who sent me? His will must satisfy you. His will must satisfy you. That's where you must draw your satisfaction from. And from finishing his work. Hallelujah. So you want to live from eternity and for eternity? You must be willing to on a daily basis sacrifice your own will and preferences. Every day. Every day. That's why we see in Christ. Say, I'm not here. I'm not doing my own thing. What I hear him say is what I say. What I see him do is what I do. Not my own desires. Because that's what I've told us. You see, what constitutes your desire? You think they are yours. They are not yours. They are time-based constructs. Are you getting it? They are time-based. Your aspirations, most of our aspirations, they are time-based. They are time-based. If you, see, if you look at Nigeria, a lot of the things we want to have, we want to be, is because of the environment. I told us about my cousin in Finland who got married to you know, a lady from Finland and you know, they were living there for a while before they moved to the UK. And he was so worried about owning a home in, in Finland. It was, it, was, it was strange to the wife. I said, ah, what do you mean by, why, why the agitation about owning a home? I said, well, good. I mean, government takes care of, you know, I mean, your, whatever it is that you're having here, it's fine. There's no, he was agitated. He was own a home. Is it because of Nigeria? The desire to own a home is here. And that agitation is here. It's our environment. That's why I say, see, question your feeling. Question your, de- question. Is it something is responsible. Other than God. It's not yours. You think it's yours. It's not yours. That pattern of response and of behavior is not yours. Sorry. It's the falling nature. Either the falling nature or your experiences, the accumulated experiences and everything you've exposed yourself to. That's the truth. Even some of our desires. That's why I told us last week. I asked the brother when he asked me, how do we acquire these things that are time-based? I said, it's the environment. And I asked him, what's your favorite food? He said, Banegusi. I said, that's it right there. A Banegusi is because of the environment. Can you imagine if you're born in Switzerland? Will a Banegusi be your favorite food? No. No. That is how time and mortality shape you and you don't know. And that's a good example. It's not a bad one. There's nothing wrong with a Banegusi. But it's just to think, to see the, how forceful environment can be. Some of you don't like salad. You don't like some kind of food. You don't like some kind of food, you know? It's an environment. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <coughs> Excuse me. It's an environment. You see, I'm using this example to help you think very deeply so that you can question certain things you are laying claim to as yours. Because you wouldn't realize if you think very deeply that it's your environment that has conditioned you to like that thing. It's your environment that has conditioned you to think that way. So that you can reflect. That's okay, how am I supposed to think from eternity? And for you to be able to do that, you must go into the word of God. What does the word of God say? That's why we say you don't know how to be unless you read the word of God. That's how you get to access eternity. The word of God. And I said this to us. See, if, the, if you read more newspaper than you read the Bible, something is still wrong with you. You are not ready to know your original identity. If you scroll social media more than you read the Bible, something is still wrong. You are not ready to be... Where are you going to? And you want to go to eternity? And everything eternity is making you feel uncomfortable here. Ah... That's why sometimes people say they want to go to heaven. I said, you have no idea where you want to go to. Because everything in time that has to do with heaven, you don't want. And that's where you want to end up. That's an irony. That's an irony. And so living from eternity must become second nature to us now. You see, anything that has to do with God, intimacy with God must become number one in our lives. You see, if God is still down, down, down your priority, your priority list, something is wrong. Where are you? Which eternity do you want to go? Where, where do you want to spend your eternity? No. 
You see, the proof that you actually you want to end up with God is in time. How are you liking God in time? And do you know what the Bible says? It said he has planted eternity where? In our heart. So eternity is in your heart. So what the word of God does, the word of God comes and tears up the eternity that is in your heart. And then it changes the way you think, the way you perceive, the way you feel. You question the way you feel. You ask yourself, why am I feeling like this? Am I feeling love towards my brother? I'm feeling he's, he's envious. If he's envious, you, you, know, you deal with it. Is it love or hate? You deal with it. Then I shouldn't be feeling like this. How am I supposed to feel? When someone wrongs you, what's coming? Is it that you're secretly wishing evil and you're wishing that person bad? That is wrong feeling. You change it quickly. I say, no, I shouldn't be feeling like this. This is not who I am. Question your thought processes. Question your feelings. They are not entirely yours. Even though you lay claim to them. Something is responsible. Your environment contributes to it. Some of us, our background, our what we were exposed to growing up, they shaped and they, and they formed us in a certain way that is not of God. And that's why I say do not succumb to the value system of this world but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Renew your mind. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And so I want us to pray. Let's start, let's start on our feet. I want us to pray and say, God, I need you to stir up eternity that you have planted in my heart. Stir up the eternity that you have planted within me. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stay it up. I align with eternity. I align with eternity. I align with eternity. I live from eternity for 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 eternity. Help me to discountenance time and its forcefulness. Help me to discountenance the forcefulness of time. Help me to discountenance the forcefulness of time. Help me, Father. Help me, Father. Help me, Father. Every mood, desires that have been crystallized, configured, that are not of eternity, Father, set me free from them. Preferences, thinking system, that have been crystallized, that are not from eternity, set me free from them. Set me free from them. Set me free from them. Feeling system, thinking system, desires, preferences that have been informed by the fallen nature and by time, by mortality, by my environment. Father, set me free from them. Help me to be alive to eternity that you have planted in my heart. Help me to live from eternity and for eternity. I break free from the stranglehold of mortality. I break free from the gravitational pull of mortality. I break free from time-based values. Time based principles in the name of Jesus. I am alive to my original design in you, oh God. I am alive to my original design in you, Father. I break free. 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 I break free, Father. Set me free. Set me free. I live for you, oh God. I live for you, O oh God. Change my taste board. Change my taste board. Change my taste board. You are here. You enjoy spending time with everything else other than God. Tell God to change your taste board. You are here reading the word of God and prayer. They are still like chores to you. Something is wrong. Ask God to help you change your taste board. If indeed you desire eternity with God, the proof is in how much time you spend with God in time. 
How much of your life is dedicated to doing His will? Tell God to change your taste board. What are the things that you have committed your life to over the years other than the word of God? Or more than the word of God? It is time that is controlling you. It's time that has gained the upper hand. Mortality has gained the upper hand. If prayer is still a chore, mortality is winning. If you would rather be watching Netflix than join prayer meeting or be in a meeting like this, mortality still has the upper hand. Because this is the foundation. This is how you live from eternity. You can't live from eternity if the word of God is not your best friend. You can't live from eternity if the word of God that is supposed to help you know who you are before the foundation of the earth, if it's the word of God that is supposed to help you know your identity is not your best friend, how can you live from eternity? Tell God to change your taste bud. Tell God to change your taste bud. Do you still have taste bud? For worldly music, do you see a taste board for songs that objectify women? Do you see a taste board for dance steps that are sensual? Do they still catch your attention or do they irritate you? If they still catch your attention, something is wrong. Mortality is behind that desire. Is lying, is it something that comes very easy to you? Or is it something you now struggle to do? If lying still comes very easy to you, mortality is still winning. It is a conditioning of time. It is a falling nature. That is not your original design. That's not your original design. Tell God to denature you right now. Tell God to denature you. Tell God to denature you. Tell him to rewire you. Tell him to reconfigure you. You cannot live from eternity like this. You cannot live for eternity like this. God is saying there is more for you in me. God is saying there is more for you in me. And he's inviting us to come into the more that exists in him for us. Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. That is what he's saying. He's inviting you. If you are still in the outer court, God is inviting you beyond the outer court. If you are still in the holy place, God is inviting you beyond the holy place. God is saying, come into the most holy place. Come into intimacy. Come into oneness with me. Come and discover your authentic identity. Come and discover who you were before the fall. Come and discover who you were in me. Before time, before the imperativeness of time, before the limitation of time, before time messed you up. into the supernatural it's an invitation into the supernatural come in come in come in it's an invitation 
into infinite possibilities. Because where we are from, eternity that we are from, there are no impossibilities there. There are no limitations there. But there are limitations in time. There are constraints in time. God is inviting you into infinite possibilities. That realm is full of solutions. That realm is full of ideas. Come in, come in, come in, come in. God wants to empower us to live above the gravitational pull of mortality. God wants to empower you to live above the limitations of time. But you must break free from the conditionalities of time. You must break free from the limitations of time for you to experience the higher life that God has designed for you. Come in. Come in. Come in. There is more for you. There is more. And the more that there is is tied to your nature. It's tied to your nature. It's tied to your nature. It's tied to your identity in Him. It's tied to your purpose in Him. Come in. Come in. Come in. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for 30 fold. Don't settle for 60 fold. Come in. There is 100 fold. The fullness of Christ is available. The fullness of Christ is available. Come in. Father, we thank you. We give you praise, God. Thank you for this invitation that you have extended to us as a people. Father, we say yes to your invitation. We say yes to your call. We say yes to your call. And Father, I pray that you will grant to each and every one of us the grace for the required transaction for us to live from eternity and for eternity. There's a price to pay. There's a price to pay. For some of you, you have to let some things go so you can spend more time in the world. For some of you, you have to reduce your wakajube so you can spend more time with God. For some of you, you have to reduce your entertainment, Netflix, Prime Video, engagement so you can spend time with God. So you can spend time in the Word of God. And I pray for the release upon you, the capacity, the grace to make these transactions in the name of Jesus. I pray that the upper realm, eternity, will become more real to you than mortality in the name of Jesus. I pray that that dimension, that dimension of infinite possibilities, that dimension where there are no restraints, there are no constraints, will become more real to you than this lowly dimension in the name of Jesus. You see, when the Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, it was referring to that dimension, not this dimension. You see, there are certain promises of God that are still hanging over our heads. They are still hanging. They are still theoretical. The only time we engage with, we see them is when we read them in the Bible. We have not touched them. We have not been able to leave them out. One of the reasons why is because we have not stepped into this dimension. When the Bible says, nothing shall be impossible, it was referring to that dimension. So when you step into that dimension and you live more from that dimension, you will be able to override time. It was PK. Pastor Kulishore, uh, I was being interviewed recently by, I think, Dr. Foy. 
And he said, he said, Elon Musk is a servant of God. Elon Musk is a servant of God. He's the anointed of God. You can be jealous all you want. Those guys are tapping into that dimension to bring solutions to the earth. And that is the truth. The guy that discovered the law of aerodynamics. When you throw something up, what happens? It comes down. This guy entered another dimension. It is that dimension so that you don't over-spiritualize that dimension. No. It was that dimension that that guy entered. Who was the guy again? That guy that discovered the law of aerodynamics. Huh? Somehow, this guy tapped into that dimension and he said to himself, something heavy can actually take off if it is powered in a certain way and it will go up and stay up. He tapped into another realm. Prior to that time, everything is that not, everything that goes up must come down. It's called the law of what? Gravity. You know, he tapped into another, a higher law beyond the law of gravity. That, that when you put some conditions together, an object, heavy object can go up and not come down. That's a difference. You see, that's what I'm talking about. One says, whatever goes up must come down. That's time. Another says, it's possible for something to go up and not come down. That's eternity. So sometimes, unbelievers, God will give them access. Yes. God will give them access to put certain solutions in the air that you and I will become, you know, will be using. Because he knows they will put in the hard work. He knows the idea will not die on the, on the altar of laziness. Yes, God will use slaves if he finds them hardworking and innovative and, you know, and he will leave sons. And lost sons will then become slaves to those things. If you, uh, Galatians 4. As long as an heir is still a child, is not disciplined, is not hardworking, is not better than a slave. I can hire a driver. Let's say I have a driver. Who is being paid salaries? My, I would rather my driver drive me than my son, Jason. He's my son. The car is his, right? But he won't drive it because he's still a boy, he's still a child. This is our reality most of the time as believers. Unfortunately, we then demonize those innovations that those who are coming. Like, Stop that. It's God. If Jesus were to be here, he would not part the Red Sea. If Moses were to be here, Moses would fly. He would fly across the Atlantic Ocean. He won't part. He won't, he won't need the staff. And you want to give God assignment to be duplicating staff for everybody. No. Very simple. He called someone. <laughs> he called someone and gave the person how to break the law of aerodynamics. Create planes. Oh, yeah, you sons, go and buy a ticket and fly. Now you can fly everywhere. You see, guys, that's why I said we must step into this dimension, guys. That dimension is for us. But as long as we are still very religious and we allow time and religion to mess up our mind, we think miracle must be something that cannot be... You think science is disproving God? No. That you can explain it does not mean it's not God. It's religious mindset that keep you locked into that. That's why believers are not open to doing great things. No, of course, we bless God for some believers who broke through those limitations and they did great stuff, inventions. So God is asking for more from us. So where are the solutions to unemployment? Where are the solutions to poverty? The solutions to energy? Low-cost housing? Where are they? They're in the same realm. So as a son, come on. Let's tap into that dimension. That's why I listed ideas as one of the things you receive from that dimension. Songs. This is what it means, guys. So when I say tap into that dimension, I'm not saying just be praying in the spirit, everything you are hearing. No, 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 please. Ideas will come from that realm. Tech solutions will come from that realm. Business ideas that will employ people in their thousands will come from that realm. That will break the law, law of time. 
They'll come from that realm. Here we are. Look at the electricity. Look at you can see me. Before now, if I don't carry one big megaphone, you can't hear me. But now I'm not holding anything. Because someone tapped into a dimension and said, Oh, there's something about air. There are devices we can create. One of them can be far off, another one can be there. We can plug that one to light. I don't have to hold anything in my hand. The person entered into another dimension. Prior to that, anything that has to do with microphone has to come with wire and cable. Someone tapped into that dimension and realized that no, there's something. We can break this law, remove the wires. So when I say tap into that dimension, I don't mean become spooky. I don't mean become irrelevant. No. As a matter of fact, the more you tap into that dimension rightly, the more relevant you become here on time. Because you will bring solutions to time. That's what it means to live from eternity, guys. To override time. It could be technology, it could be in the arts, it could be in music, it could be in painting, it could be in pictures, photography, it could be in business, it could be in templates, policies, solutions, frameworks for getting things done. It could be anything, it could be books, knowledge captured in books. AI technologies. Tools for personal transformation. When you then create it, people will then line up and buy and, you know, do that. Hallelujah. Father, we open our mind to these things. The infinite possibilities. Don't forget that. Infinite possibilities. Infinite possibilities. The possibilities in that realm are endless. The solutions in that realm are endless. They are endless. Father, open our eyes to them. Ask God to open your eyes. You see, some of you are not not praying because you don't believe that God can bring a tech solution through you. You don't believe. That's why you're not asking. Ah, It's faith. Without faith, you can't receive. You, You can't receive. God is giving you an open check right now and you don't want to fill it in. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, do you just want to pass the earth and just walk away like every other person without making your mark on earth? What will be the impact of your Christianity? That you know God, what will be the difference you will make in life, in the, in the lives of people? Are you going to set up systems and structures that will ensure we reduce the number of out of school children in Nigeria? Can you do that? Can you trust God for ideas? Technology that can help us achieve low cost housing. I mean, the possibilities are endless. What can you trust God for? How is God going to be at the mercy of time? The conditioning of time. No. Rise above them. When we say we want to rise above these limitations, this is what it looks like. Rise above them. Rise above them. Rise above them. Father, we thank you, Lord. We are your sons. We are your sons. And we have come to maturity. And we keep chasing maturity. We are your sons, Father. We understand hard work. We understand discipline. We understand consistency. We understand never giving up. We understand process. So we are ready, Father. Give us those ideas. We will pour the night candle and ensure that they come to light. Give us those ideas, oh God. We will collaborate. We will not think small. We will not think of owning everything. We will collaborate. We will bring people in. Because sometimes it's the smallness of our mind. Because there are some, some, some solutions that you carry. You can't execute by yourself. You need partners. But if your mind is it thinking, I want to own 100%, I want to own 100%, that thing will never come to the, to, to the, to the light of day. Because you are thinking small. Look at all the big tech products. The people. What's God to is the percentage of the people that actually invented them? Small. They collaborated. They opened up. 
the former CEO of uh, of Facebook. She's, she's worth like about two or three billion US dollars. She's the CEO or CFO. She recently resigned, I think last year, a couple of months ago. She's now on the board of her, uh, you know, advisors for, you know, Meta. You see, if, if Mark Zuckerberg had wanted to own Facebook all by himself, just keep it, keep it, keep it. Now, break free, poverty mentality, break free. Desire for other people to be blessed. Create things that will bless people. You see, these are the certain mindset, you know, that keep us locked in our smallness. We can't see how that solution will affect lives. You're just thinking about yourself. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You see, see, there's some kind of money that some of us will not have if you don't break through this mindset. Because you're always thinking about yourself. But if you think about others, being a blessing, carry other people in your heart, God will say, I can trust you with this business. And when the business expands, you will bring those people in. You bring those people in. And then when you bring those people in, bam! It grows beyond your wildest imagination. That's why the Bible says the sons of this world are wiser. They are wiser than us. This is how they are wiser. And as long as they are wise, and as long as they can do these things, God will continue to resource them. But your time is here. Oh, son of God, your time is here. Oh, son of God, your time is here. Oh, son of God, your time is here. Your time is here. The sons are rising. The sons of the kingdom, the heads of the kingdom, we are rising and we are taking our place. And we say, Father, you can trust us. We will not allow the smallness of our mind to kill your deposit in our lives. We will be broad-minded, generous. Think about impact. We will think about impact. We will think about how lives can be improved. We carry a heart for humanity. We carry heart for a heart for humanity. We carry a heart for humanity. This is who we are, Father. We give you praise, God. We honor you. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us be seated. Hallelujah. My siblings, this is what it is about. This is some of the mindset that must be broken. You see those guys in the world who are coming up with those stuff, you, you might be, oh, they are unbeliever, they are unbeliever. God resource them with those ideas. It's the same thing, you know, it's the same thing. It looks like the West is more developed than here. It's because those ideas God gives people here, they will die. They will be crude. You can use it. What are we saying? Crude oil. Crude. Oil, crude. And it's crude form. We can't add value to it. We can't add value to it. What's that? You can't add value to it. Even when the government puts money to build refineries, you will see Nigerians in that system will sabotage. I mean, we can't think. We can't, we can't see that this country can lead the continent out of the doldrums. Some small minded people just surround everywhere. Small minded. Small minded. All they think about is their bank account. And they can't see that if they allow this system to work, it's not just Nigerians that will be liberated from the shackles of poverty. We will lead the African continent out of the doldrums. But they are so small-minded. And then you find other countries that are not even as endowed as Nigeria, but because they have the right mindset, they are able to make the most out of the little that they have. And there are those who have so much. Because of here, 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 this mind so small. They would rather be driving Rolls Royce in the midst of poverty. They, how, how is that? How, how can you just want to drive Rolls Royce in the midst of poverty around you? 
You know, why not democratize wealth? Why not want to democratize development? So that you can be proud. Today, we complain about how they see our green passport. It's why? Because we don't even respect ourselves. We will respect you. And look down on our passport. It's because of this mindset, guys. This, this, this mindset. That's it. If we don't break out of this mindset, Nigeria will not realize our full potential. And as a church, we can't be light. We can't call ourselves light in the midst of the darkness and we don't lead the charge. We must lead the charge for the transformation of Nigeria. The church must lead the charge for the transformation of Nigeria. We must. We have the light. We are the salt of the earth. Where's our saltiness? Where's our light? If things going, keep going wrong in our country, where's our saltiness? Where's our light? Where's the difference we are making? Where's the difference we are supposed to make? Every day, I wake up with a sense of responsibility for the way things are in this country. I wake up with that sense of responsibility every day. Every day. Even though every day, I am working towards fixing and changing things and doing my part every day, but I still feel responsible. I still feel responsible. You know, just small-mindedness. Small-mindedness. See, small. Very small. Thinking small. It's a small-mindedness that I want to make you just immerse, you know, what we call a primitive accumulation of wealth at the expense of the people. It's, small, it's poverty in the mind. It says the disease of the mind. Poverty. Disease of the mind. You know, people can't find joy in seeing the mass majority of the people live well. Come on now. Can you just imagine the fulfillment? Can you imagine driving on the street and you don't see a single child coming to your window to knock and ask for money? Can you imagine that? How do, how do you feel every time you drive and you see women with children? You see young children that should be in school. They are coming to knock on your window. How does it make you feel? Every time it breaks my heart. Every time it breaks my heart. And I can't get used to it, I'm sorry. I can't get comfortable in this environment. Doesn't matter how I live, doesn't matter, you know, I can't get comfortable. It's not normal to be comfortable in an environment where children are on the street begging. We shouldn't be comfortable. We shouldn't. That's not life, as far as I'm concerned. I don't care the kind of car you drive, I don't care the house you live in, I don't care what your bank balance is. You're as poor as all of us. If you live in the midst of poverty like that, we're all poor. Your home may not just be money. Mm. But you're poor. As long as these young ones and there's so much, there's mass poverty around us, we're all poor. Everything here is mindset. And so we as believers, we must lead the church. We must think differently. We must act differently. We must. Because we're, we're connected. You see, the same way you can raise your children by the book, same way you can build your personal life by the book, you can do your business by the book. We can build our nation, Nigeria, by the book. And God does not need all of Nigerians, everybody to be believers. He just needs what? A critical mass of church people. Just a critical mass. Just a critical mass. That's why God can reduce an army of 32,000 soldiers to 300 and deliver a whole nation. Because he found a critical mass in the 300. So it's not about the number. It's not about the number. It's about the critical mass arriving at a point that not this is it, this must be done. And they commit to it. That's why we can't have over 100 million Christians in Nigeria. Nigeria is still like this. It's not, it's not acceptable. That's why Christianity is questionable. Big question mark. It is. We are light carriers. We are the salt of the earth. 
Hallelujah. And so, you see, what I just did is to show you how this mindset, I heard some of the rough and rough in time, you know, can affect you as an individual and affect a people. You see, that corruption of the mind is what is now affecting a whole nation, a population of over 200 million people. It's the same thing. So as you and I, you and I commit to say, okay, no, God, I'm going to be different. I choose to be different. And then it shows in our job, uh, everything that we do. And then we continue to increase the critical mass. And God begins to entrust solutions to us. And you will not sleep on those solutions. You will not be lazy. Because sometimes when God sees someone, we are lazy. God will put certain ideas in your heart because he knows that this idea will die on the altar of laziness. You're not disciplined. You can't be consistent. That's why God will carry those ideas and give to people that are disciplined. Those that will burn the midnight candle. Those that will bring other people on board. Because they are broad-minded. They are thinking about society. And not just themselves. So these are some of the things that are needed for us to be able to live from eternity and for us to be able to override time and to establish the will of the Father in our respective jurisdictions. And so God is challenging us and is calling us into more of himself. To break free from religious mindset. Like I've been telling us, we must rethink what we refer to as miracle. Miracle is not just that someone is sick and you lay hand. No. Laser surgery is a miracle. And I'm not saying we will not. You see, let me tell you what miracles look like. Particularly those miracles. It was because there were no alternatives. Can you get me? When there will be no alternative, fire will lay hand, you will get healed. Or sometimes just come on. Just you know, just take paracetamol and sleep. You'll be fine. Whoever invented that is a miracle. Are you guys getting it? That's why I said Moses were to be here today. He will go to the airport and fly. Moses had just one stick. You want to fly, you want to fly, you want to fly, you want to fly. And you are going to different destinations. Who will use the stick first? <laughs> you all line up. Everybody will line up. Oh yeah, Moses, please use the stick. Oh, it's my turn. Where will you travel? Where will you travel if you're all lining up to use Moses' stick to part the Red Sea? God knew in the future, population will grow. I want things to move very fast. And he caught this guy to just, you know, come up with a new law. Now we have planes everywhere. We have airports everywhere. Just buy your ticket. Go to the airport. You fly. At the same time, you can be going to Kutunweji. And that person is going to Enugu. And that person is going. At the same time. Same day, we're flying. Different places. Now, we're not limited to the stick to part the Red Sea. So we must rethink miracle. We must rethink what is miraculous. That's one of the challenges we have. Religious spirit. Tradition. That's one of the challenges. So be broad-minded. You see, in that realm, the possibilities are endless. Tap into that realm. Get some ideas that will bring solutions to human problems. Get ideas. Laser surgery is a miracle. And imagine you're operating on people without cutting them open. You think that's not a miracle? Oh, just because science can explain it makes it less of, less of a miracle? No. No, that science can explain does not make it less of a miracle. You guys think there's a conflict between science and God? No, there is not. It's just people, confused-minded people that are thinking that, you know, that's not. No. Just people are confused. Who think uh, science, anything that is explainable is not God. Come on now. It's religious mindset. It's religious mindset. As explainable, does not make it less God and less miraculous. As a matter of fact, that we can explain is a higher level of miracle. Because it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the honor of kings to what? To search it, to search it out. It's a great privilege that we have science to create things. Because when you can explain, you can replicate. When you understand the process, you can build it again and again and again and again. 
That is why you see some of the anointing and the operations of the anointing sometimes, once it works, it, there's no guarantee to work again. Ten people can come out here, can lay hands, only one person will be healed. That's how God wants it. That's the nature of the anointing. That's why you see Jesus, some of his miracles, they are not repetitive. They are different. Depending on the situation. But there are certain solutions that are miraculous that God wants us to perpetuate and, you know, use it to advance human life. And, you know, so we can't, as church people, we can't be stuck in that box. No. We can't. Hallelujah. Are you challenged? Are you going to do something big for humanity? Are you going to make a difference? Because there are deposits of God on the inside of you. That God has put on the inside of you to make a difference in different fields. So don't settle for less. Amen. God bless you. Hi there. Have you ever wondered if there is more to Christianity than what is popular? Are you dissatisfied in any way with your present spiritual state and your yearning for more of God? Do you desire a company of people who are on a journey of maturity toward Christ-likeness? Do you want your Christianity to make a positive impact on society? If you answer yes to any of these questions, then I would like to invite you to the Finishing Church here in Abuja. We are a borderless kingdom community of people who are being trained and equipped to become like Christ in order to impart our society positively. We are also being prepared for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We are the new breed that is committed to bringing all of God's purposes to completion here on earth. And we look forward to welcoming you home. God bless you.